This is Gordon from Solar Eclipse Timer. If I asked you to name three structural things that were different about the first Titan sub, the one whose hull cracked in the Bahamas, versus the second Titan sub, the one that made it to the Titanic but imploded, what would you say? Things usually break at interfaces. Well, everyone would know the first major thing. They built a completely new hull with a new fabrication technique. If you followed the story at all, you would know that. I did three in-depth videos about the hull, the build based on five inches, the grind spots on the layers, and the disintegrating glue film layer. If you watch those videos, you know a tremendous amount about the hull of the Titan. I think a fair amount of you would know the second major change. The viewport in the second Titan was new. It was the same design as the first one built by Hydrospace, but the second one was built by Heinz Fritz Company. I did an in-depth video about the viewport design and the depth rating controversy. But how many of you can name the third major structural change? If you are one of the people that believe the implosion of the Titan was due to a failure at the glued interface between the titanium rings and the hull, then continue watching to learn about the link to the third structural change. The company that worked closely with OceanGate to build the first submersible was Spencer Composites. Remember, this was the first attempt at engineering the submersible, so everything was being figured out for the first time. Spencer designed the shape of the titanium domes. They weren't dumb. They did some serious computations and some real computer analysis. It's unclear in the initial designs what they planned for the rings, because the Spencer document shows a rudimentary design with a very small size for the rings. They also spent time with two ring designs, because one design was going to connect the carbon fiber hull to carbon fiber domes, but those domes did not work out. The second design was for the titanium rings and the titanium domes to be attached to the carbon fiber hull. You can see that the design was quite basic. The drawings also reveal that they initially were working with a hole that was four and a half inches thick. Tony testified that he worked closely with Spencer on the interfaces where the two different materials met. The design of the clevis for the Tang was a collaborative effort with Brian. All these critical interfaces were collaborative events really with the experts who, who kind of know, really know that better than, than most. So they designed new interface rings for both the forward and rear connection point of the hull. In the new design, the C-channel width was increased to 5 inches to fit a 5-inch thick hull. So Tony was well aware of the issues regarding using dissimilar materials, and they had to do the proper engineering. Can you explain the importance of matching moduli between the different materials mm -hmm. used in a design? Things, things usually break at interfaces, typically, because they don't move together. One wants to go that way, and the other wants to go that way. Or one wants to go this way that much, and this other part wants to go that much. And so you have a high energy um, interface with that. If everything moved together, you kind of you rule that out. And so the titanium and the hull all had to be moving together. And to achieve that by the FEA, that caused us to, I want to say, tweak the shape of especially the first ring segment. That gave us the modulus. And that's why the rings, really the titanium pieces, to the first hull, to serial number one, those are a match set. If you look carefully at the cross section of the titanium rings, this funny curved shape was engineered that way on purpose to match the behaviors of the titanium and the carbon fiber. Tony also worried about supporting the entire hull, so the rings were fixed to the substructure landing gear in three positions, the bottom and the two sides. And in fact, in order to give it uniform loading um, all the way around the rings, the landing gear was designed to give it fixity in three places. If you can think of 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and 270. So, so with three, three places in fixity in space, then that maintains curvature across the top. And I wouldn't buy into the idea of, of changing that what, whatsoever. Early images of the Titan on a crane show straps cradling it from the bottom of the landing gear. 
I imagine this was cumbersome because they had to wrap the straps around the landing gear and use blocks to keep the straps from rubbing forcefully on the sub. There is one other picture I found where they seem to have the crane rigging fixed to the top part of the landing gear frame, not straps traveling beneath the landing gear. Tony probably would have been okay with that rigging. A chart from Britannica compares the gross weight of Titan to the Alvin submersible. Titan is still heavy at 23,000 pounds, about half the weight of Alvin. But Titan has more passenger room, five people instead of three. This is the reason Stockton wanted to use carbon fiber. So if you haven't figured it out already, let me tell you what the third major structural change was. It was welding lifting eyes on the titanium rings, two on the forward ring and two on the aft ring. When Tony was still with OceanGate, someone brought up the idea of welding lifting eyes on the rings of the sub to make it easier to rig to get it on and off a trailer for transportation or on and off the LARS. Tony said absolutely not. The rings weren't engineered to take those loads and the rings were already glued onto the hull so you could not generate all that heat to do welding at that point. Four lifting points on the rings would amount to over 5,500 pounds of weight per lifting point. Tony was concerned about the glue joint. He said you might not see the rings deform visually, but that doesn't mean they aren't being deformed by the lift and affecting the glue joint. You see, after the first hull failed, they cut the carbon fiber hull from the rings. They then milled out the residual carbon fiber out of the sea channels so the rings could be used again. The ring, the titanium ring, glues onto that five inch section. That glue doesn't, doesn't come out. That's how the rings were removed. They were sawed off and then the rings were milled out. So now that Tony was gone and the rings were off the hull, they took the opportunity to weld two lifting eyes on the top section of each of the two rings. This is despite Tony telling them in the past that the rings were not designed to take the vertical load like that. The CG, center of gravity, of serial number one was not the center of the case. The center gravity of the entire vehicle when assembled was actually aft a bit. And it was, it was enough where, where the vehicle, if hung by lifting eyes, would, would sit cantered. There's a few items that, that I told the team you, you can absolutely not do. And welding lifting eyes on, ring, on the rings was one of them that was first proposed by Scott Griffith in Stockton. And, and I, well, one, I told him, no, you can't do it because of the loads. Two, we're already glued to the, to the, um, to the carbon fiber. The reason why I told him he can't have the um, lifting eyes welded to, the, uh, to ring one was the clevis, the dimensions of the clevis be being the C part, for, for maybe those who, who don't know, it's a clevis and tang. The tang being the carbon fiber um, on the inside. That dimension of the top there, it's a small dimension. The, the rings and the domes were never designed to take excessive load in a sheer direction. And so that would be a sliding interface, or if I, if I give it fixity looking like this, shear would be something pushing down on it. And so if you could think of the weight of the hull on the clevis, shear would be pushing on this little lip here. And that's a, it's a small dimension. The point of those was just to keep it glued in, in place because subsea structures, a beautiful thing about them is it's uniform loading all the way around. It's, it's not statically loading like, like, like your automobile or your house where everything's just pointed down. So the rings, when you, when you lift it and it canters like this, that's now a peeling at the top of the forward, right at the lip, and it is a peeling on the aft part of that lip um, on the back. There is rigidity in the system. So at the mi macro scale, it doesn't look like it moves at all. But really, we're worried about the micro scale. Like a little bit of movement, is it enough to peel that glued interface away from the carbon fiber part? We don't know that. So I told him you can't have it. Serial number one was designed to lift 
every other place but or the rings. It was not designed to uh, to do that. And then then the problem with that is water intrusion, really, more than more than anything. The ring's not going to fall off, but it's water intrusion. Uh, really, would be would be the problem. So when you see a picture of the Titan, you can always tell if it's the second sub because the fiberglass fairing has these four circular cutouts on the top for the rigging to be attached to the new lifting eyes. This is an image of the brand new V2 hull at Electro Impact. You see the lifting eyes are installed. They were used to lift the sub onto the trailer as it is now ready to be transported to its next destination to be worked on. Here is the sub at the deep ocean test facility. You see the lifting eyes are being used to get it in and out of the chamber. Then it was lifted to get transported back to Washington, lifted in and out of the factory, lifted up and down for water testing, and possibly lifted on and off the LARS. Look at the large size of the rigging needed to lift it. Then it was lifted to get on a trailer to go to Newfoundland, then on and off the LARS to the dock for the 2021, 2022, and 2023 seasons. So Titan was probably lifted on these eyes over 20 times. Remember that the first rings were reused on the second sub, and the lifting eyes were added. Based on the original engineering done by Tony and Spencer, Tony was clear in his testimony that the rings were not designed to take that lifting load and lifting eyes should not be welded onto the rings. However, there was another engineering company involved prior to the second sub, now called Collier Aerospace. There is one image in the Coast Guard documents that is a document from this company which looks like a stress test of the forward dome. Other than this document, the input from this company is a mystery. Perhaps they did additional analysis and came up with a different conclusion than Spencer and Tony and said it was fine to weld lifting eyes on the rings. At this time, we do not have that information. If there's no sound engineering supporting the safety of welding lifting eyes to the rings, then the concern of Tony Nissen for the potential creation of microfractures in the top glue joint leading to high pressure water intrusion may be valid. At 3,300 meters, the depth reached by the Titan on the final dive prior to implosion, the water pressure would have been around 4,800 PSI. Water intrusion at the glued joint is conceivable as the failure that caused the implosion. We will need to wait and see if the final NTSB report addresses this concern and lists it as a final possible failure point. Thank you for watching.